Binge reading this week, best-selling biographical fiction author Marie Benedict talks about her latest bestseller, The Mitford Affair, the story of the beautiful and notorious Mitford sisters, famous as the debutante daughters of an English peer and then infamous as World War II traitors. Welcome to the joys of binge reading, the show for anyone who ever got to the end of a great book and wanted to read the next instalment. We interview successful series authors and recommend the best in mystery, suspense, historical and romance series, so you'll never be without a book you can't put down. You'll find this episode's show notes, a free ebook, and lots more information at thejoysofbingereading.com. And now, here's our show. Hi there, I'm your host Jenny Wheeler, and critics rave about Marie Benedict's uncanny ability to unearth untold women's stories. From Albert Einstein's wife to the hidden life of Agatha Christie. From J.P. Morgan's personal librarian to Andrew Carnegie's maid. She's written about them all and as I say, the latest one is about the Mitford sisters. In Binge Reading today, Marie talks about where her passion for storytelling comes from and how she works on excavating stories like a literary archaeologist. Our giveaways this week Two of the books in the Of Golden Blood Old California series, books five and six. There's a rancher mystery and a Spanish romantic novella, and books seven and eight on sale. Can a sugar heiress and a winemaker solve a puzzling murder before their vintage turns deadly? That's a San Francisco mystery and a Hawaiian Christmas novella. Don't forget, if you enjoy the show, do leave us a review so others can find us too. But now, here's Marie. Hello there, Marie, and welcome to the show. It's great to have you with us. I am absolutely delighted to be here. As, as I said to you right before you hit the record button, obviously I love to talk books, but oh my gosh, I love New Zealand. And it's just such a delight to get to talk with you while you're there. That's wonderful. Now you've made a name for yourself writing best-selling historical fiction about real women's stories, some of them well-known women, others of them not so well-known at all. But the one that we're talking about particularly today, the latest one, is about the very famous Mitchford girls in wartime England and just before the Second World War. Tell us, okay. first of all, where did this love of really, all, well, they're not forgotten women, but women's stories yeah. come from? Well, for me, it started long, long ago, decades ago, when I was in middle school in my early teenage years. And I had this wonderful aunt who was an English professor and a poet, and she was a rebellious nun, and she was just awesome. And she was the one who was, you know, if you're lucky in your life, you have the this one person who gives you the right books, the perfect books at the right time. And she was that person in my life. And she gave me many really impactful books. But the one that set me on the path that I'm on today started with a book she gave me. It was called The Mists of Avalon. It was, you know, it's not going to sound revolutionary when I describe it, but back when it was first written, it really was. It was a retelling of the Arthurian legend from the perspective of the women. And it was like, in our lives, we have these epiphanal moments. And that's what it was for me. It was like, oh my God, like history, legend, lore, is so much more than I've been told. It's so much bigger. And there are so many voices and perspectives that people are not hearing. And that is really when my quest began. And I ended up going to getting a a history degree. And then I took this long detour as a lawyer before I circled back to this and to writing these stories, which is really what I was always supposed to be doing, I think. And that's such a good way of describing what you do, revealing the details of the stories. Now with the Mitfords, there's a lot of detail there to be unearthed. Yeah. What drew you to them? I mean, they aren't famous women. A lot of their story was already known. Right. So, you know, it's interesting. There's only a couple women that I've written about who were known. You know, Agatha Christie is the, probably the most famous one. But in each case where I've chosen a woman who's better known, it's a lesser known part of their life that I'm interested in exploring. I'm interested in exploring the secrets, the things that were brushed under the rug, and the way in which those things 
reverberated into the present. I'm all about the legacy. And sometimes we think like with Agatha Christie, which was a couple of books ago, we think we know her and we think we know her legacy. But the reality is there's so much more to her story. And I'm interested in that part of women and women's histories as well. Yes. Now, with the Mitford affair, which has been described as downtown Abbey meets the crown, you've got six, <laughs> six extraordinary sisters who enthralled yeah. England and much of the world. Now, they look in the mid-1930s like they were totally destined to marry lords and just to have a rich and, and aristocratic life. And because of the way things turned out politically with the war, it didn't happen like that at all. Now, you excavate the rivalries between the sisters very well. Was that part of what drew you to the story, the way they all six worked together or against each other? Yeah, it was fascinating to me. So I am the oldest of six, four sisters and two brothers, and my family is not like theirs. Nobody's like them at first. But at the same time, I have seen firsthand the way in which sibling relationships dictate our personalities our belief systems, the decisions we make, and sometimes it's unconscious. And when I got to know the Midford story, which actually they weren't super well known to me until I did some research for another book I wrote about the Churchills. And I wrote a book about Winston Churchill's wife and the Midfords who were related to the Churchills kept on coming up. And that was when I learned more and more about the role these women played first as social luminaries who defied everybody's expectations that they'd marry well, right, except for one sister, and then these darker pieces of their past. And that story overlaid with this sibling relationship and the way in which these sisters each followed dramatically different political paths at a time period of, of great unrest and great polarization. It was just fascinating to me to see how those things evolved, particularly when you look at our own society and the way in which we have so much polarization today. I'm always interested in the way in which the past reverberates into the present. And I just, I couldn't resist it. I couldn't resist their story. Their mother, R Lady Reedsdale, apparently mm -hmm. once said, whenever I see the words Piers' daughter in a headline, I know it's going to be something about one of my girls. <laughs> yes. Um, exactly. So, and she wasn't exaggerating, was she? No, she wasn't. I mean, they were regularly in the newspaper. Now, admittedly, in the earlier years, it was more society reports. You know, the girls were all debutantes. They were always the best balls and their outfits and the people they danced with, all those things. And that, that was another interesting part of the world. And yet, as y the years went on, what they were most known for was the scandals in which they became embroiled. Beginning with Diana, the third oldest, who had been, oh my gosh, she's the one who started out marrying well, right? She married the heir to the Guinness Beer Fortune, had this fabulous life with her adoring husband and her two young children, and she left it all for a married man, Sir Oswald Wellesley, who was the head of the leader of the fascist unit in Great Britain. And it was just unfathomable to people. And it was the stuff of great scandal. I mean, that was the sort of thing that just simply wasn't done. Even today, it would have been a huge scandal, but back then even more so. And that was just the beginning of the sorts of things that these sisters became headline news. Mosley, I, I could not really understand the attraction for him. And when I Googled around a wee bit about him, I found that he was an absolute philanderer who at, right at the beginning oh, made it clear that he horrible. wasn't going to leave his wife. So it wasn't as if she was just quietly going to take up s separate residences and then marry him as soon as he was available. She understood right from the beginning that wasn't going to happen. Did you ever really get a sense of why he was so utterly tempting? You know, it's such a great question. And you and I are not the only two to muse on that. Sometimes when I give speeches, I like to even just show pictures. Like her first husband was stunning and smart and kind and adored her. And then you've got this other guy who's a cat and he's married and he's sleeping with his sister's-in-law and he's just awful in every sense of the word. And I, I don't know that we'll ever really know why, but I think my personal pop psychology view, having spent way too much time with Diana, is that it was the thrill of the chase. 
you know, mostly was never, ever really hers. Not even when they married, not even in later years. I don't want to give too much away, but when they were social pariahs, when they had children together, he was a challenge. And Diana was very smart. She lived in an era where careers were really weren't something that women, at least women of her stature, generally did. And I think she was horribly bored by all that adulation and easy life that Brian Guinness offered. And I think Mosley was a challenge. Yes. And she went after him with her heart and her mind. She became fully enamored of his belief system. She was an apolitical creature prior to being with him. She adopted his views as her views. And I think it, everything she did was service of keeping Mosley close. That's my personal view. I think he was, he never really was hers. And that was a great challenge for her. Yes. Now, the story focuses a lot on Nancy Mitford, who we know very well as a, a top novelist and her yeah. rising alarm about the passion that both Diana and the other sister Unity seem to be developing for the Nazi party. It's clear also that you bring out well that the two sisters, Unity and Diana, probably went for the Nazis for very different motivations. I mean, you've already made it clear that probably Diana went simply because it was a way to influence and gain power over Oswald, whereas Unity was probably a genuine convertee. Talk a bit about the dynamic between those three sisters. Yeah, you've just asked such a good question. One of the things that was really fascinating for me was how people form their political belief systems, right? It isn't the way I naively thought years ago when people read about them and then came up with an informed belief system that matched their morals. I don't think for most people it's that conscious a decision. I think very often our political belief systems are born out of personal uh, things that are happening to us personally, and we become, follow one movement or the other based on that. And I think, as you mentioned, in Diana's case, Oswald was the head of the fascists in Great Britain. It behooved him to forge alliances with the other fascist leaders across Europe. And through, and I'll talk in a minute, a connection that Diana had with Hitler, she wanted to deliver an alliance with Hitler to him because that would cement her relationship with Mosley forever. And that's basically what she did. So I think she went after her belief system, her adherence to Nazism in a very calculating way to serve a very personal desire. It's funny because on the other hand, when you look at Unity, who, you know, you want to dislike her more because in many ways she is like a true believer in Nazism. And that part of her is really reprehensible. But she comes to that belief system for more sympathetic reasons. She was really the odd man out in her, her familial sibling dynamic. She was the least attractive. She was the most ungainly. She was not the prettiest. She was not the smartest. At least that's what the other sisters told her. And she wanted to find her own way of standing out, her own identity, her own special thing. And unfortunately, she chose Nazism. It was the worst thing. But the reason she chose it was a really sad reason. It was trying to fill a void and create an identity for her. And her obsession with Nazism and, and Adolf Hitler specifically, with whom she had a very close relationship, it's just appalling. And yet, when you look at the why, you think it was really Diana who was much more manipulative in mm. that dynamic of the relationship. Mm. Now, this is interesting. I know I don't want to get us into trouble talking current politics, but I know you do you do note that these ways that we form our views on politics, whether the personal comes first or whether the political thinking comes first, would you like to comment at all in your own world on how you see that playing out today? Well, I have to say it was trying to understand people's political views that attracted me to this story. In this world, when we have such far ranging and distinctly opposite political views, and sometimes in people that I find surprising, right? I think we've all had the experience of having someone that we think we're close to or thought we know and their political views surprise us. And I was having a lot of trouble trying to understand it. And 
in this book, it throws all those issues in bold relief. It really lays bare how people come to believe what they believe. Yeah. And it helped yeah. me process it. It didn't give me all the answers or anything, but or nor did it always, always made me more sympathetic, but it definitely helped me understand. And very often when I choose a topic and a woman, usually each woman's life has topics that lend itself to the story. I'm usually processing something of my own. And for me, this story uh, was helping me process some very real political divisions that I was seeing in modern times. Yes, because they generate such absolute passion sometimes, don't they? And I uh, think looking from afar, one of the things, and I guess it, I'm certain it happens everywhere, is the way that some people very conveniently can drop some of their moral or ethical views mm -hmm. to follow someone who quite clearly is not of the same level and brush those under the carpet. And that seemed to happen with both of the Mitford girls oh. who, went, who went after Nazism. They could turn an utterly blind eye. I think Unity was living in an apartment that had been taken away from a Jewish family. It, it was like blinders in, in, mm. in her case. And I think she was, in many ways, I think, not mentally well. She was unstable emotionally. And that's not an excuse on her part mm. by any, mm. any stretch. But her ability to put those blinders on, was it was almost illusional, right? Diana knew, and it didn't suit her, so she chose not to, to address mm -hmm. it or think mm -hmm. about it. So it was amazing to me the way in which they could pick and choose what part of the belief system that appealed to them. And you get to see it play out with their parents as well. Here you have Lord and Lady Reedsdale. I mean, Lord Reedsdale hated the Germans. He fought against them in World War I. He would storm around the house sometimes, yelling about the Huns, which is what he called the Germans when the girls were growing up. And he really made this complete sea change in his, in his viewpoint and knew full well what people were saying and intimating about what was going on with the Jewish population of Germany. And he was making excuses for it in public. And then he made a complete switcheroo again. You know, it's just amazing the way in which people can convince themselves into whatever belief system and set of facts that they want because it suits them at the time. Yes. And, and that's exactly what happened with the Midfords. Now, Nancy's role in this, I'm not quite sure how much you've deduced or how much is actually written record, but it okay. certainly sounds like with her relationship with Winston Churchill, that in the end, she did have a hand in dobbing them in. Is that right? That is true. Yeah. There are recently in the past several years, that's released MI5 records or sealed, you know, during the this time period of the book mm. in which Nancy very plainly stated Diana's complicity with the Nazis and her fears for what she might undertake. Now, do, do I know that Nancy did the things that she did in the book? No, I don't know that. I think to know some of the things that she knew, she had to do some level of snooping. Yes. Right. Yes, she did. Yes. But she did have to come to that crisis of conscience about what pathway she was going to go. Was she going to continue to stay loyal to her sisters, defend them no matter what? Or was she going ultimately to be loyal to her country mm. and to the belief system that it espoused? And she does make a choice. How far she went in her actual activities, that's where the fiction came in because we don't know. Exactly. We do know that she was working with the government. We know that I don't know to what extent Winston was involved in that, but given his role and their relationship with her family, I can't imagine it didn't come up. I just can't imagine that. Yes. Yeah. So a lot of that stuff is definitely speculation, but her role in her sister's, I guess it's, it's a spoiler, but I'm going to say it anyway, in her sister's incarceration is factual, 100%. You can sympathize when you remember that her own husband was fighting, actually physically fighting in the war at the time that Diana was still s s scheming for the day Hitler was going to be leaving England, basically. But, right. Looking ahead to feather her own future once he was the in power. That's a great way to put it, feather her own future. I love that. You know, it was like she was readying the runway 
She was creating a communication system so that he could spread propaganda and communicate among followers. She was propping up financially the fascists in Great Britain so that when Hitler successfully marched across their country, there would be a ready group of people to take power. It was like once she had decided she was going to throw her lot in with Mosley, by God, she was going to make him successful. <laughs> and that was really her end game, right? Was that this was her horse and she yeah. put her money on him and she was going to win and she was going to do whatever it took to make that horse victorious. Mm -hmm. And she did. I mean, she, the stuff she did was really unbelievable. And the access that she and Unity both had to Adolf Hitler is nothing short of shocking. Tell me one thing that I didn't quite pick up from the book, and I couldn't even find it when I Googled around. When she was taken into prison as a political prisoner and a danger to English war yeah. efforts, she had a very young son. Did he go to prison with her or was he looked after by someone else? No, when he was just a couple months old, she went to prison and she was not released for the rest of the war. They were separated for years. She was given periodic visits with him. Her nanny took the children. She had a toddler and a newborn. She took the children. And as you can imagine, a lot of people didn't want to take them in, right? Her parents were falling apart separately because um, Unity had shot herself and was at death's door and then much compromised after that. And there was a big divide between the parents. So her, her parents, who had been supportive, weren't able to or weren't willing to take them in. Nancy, of course, wasn't going to do it. Deborah was still very young. But Pamela, uh, the one sister who also had fascist sympathies, and so did her husband, although they were not as active in, in any stretch as, as Unity and Diana, Pamela and her husband took in Diana's children and, with a nanny, of course, because, you know, Women at that time did not raise children no, at that not, no. level, right? They had yeah. an army to do that. But the other two were with Brian Guinness, who obviously was not in prison. And so he was able to look after them. It was the Mosley children that were really left out in the cold. And so it was Pamela who took them in for the years that they were incarcerated. Mm -hmm. They both seem to have had reasonably successful careers. Seemed that they managed okay anyway from the little that I could pick up. Yeah. Yeah. After, after prison, you mean? Both the parents and the sons, though. Max, we don't have quite a... Well, right. Yes, they did. Yeah. They did. Yeah. Certainly, they had to deal with the notoriety of their parents. Absolutely. But they had managed to rise up and, and have very successful careers afterwards. Mm. That was a fascinating book, which I, m I must recommend to everybody yeah. listening. And I haven't had a chance to read the Agatha Christie book yet, but it sounds wonderful. You mentioned it at the beginning. And I gather part of it focuses on that unknown period where she disappeared and it never quite has come to light in the general press what exactly went on in those years. Did you find it fascinating to dig around on that? Oh, so fascinating. I've always been a fan of that golden age of mystery fiction, which Agatha's the queen, but there's many others that I adore. And that same aunt that I mentioned earlier, she gave me a bazillion Agatha Christie books. And I just always love the time period and the puzzles. But I realized that I didn't know the woman, right? Here we have this woman who is the most successful writer of all time. She has sold billions of copies of her books. They continue to sell. They continue to be made into adaptations. And yet we just have a very specific sense of her in her later years, sipping tea, wearing tweeds at a English country estate and the reality of who she was and who she became and the mystery surrounding her very real life disappearance. She disappeared for 11 days. It led to the largest manhunt in England's history. All of those things were so fascinating. I just couldn't get my head around the fact that this woman who created these unsolvable puzzles would have an unsolvable puzzle at the heart of her own life. And I just... Again, that was one that I just, I had to dig around and find out. And if you've got any breakthrough books, if you've got a book that's given you a special thrill, what would it be? I honestly, I, I love each of my women so much. They're, they're my companions and I'm their advocate and I feel honored to tell their stories. I, if I had to pick ones, I would definitely say the first one, Maleba Einstein. That's the first of these books that I wrote. She was Albert Einstein's first wife. She was a physicist. 
I believe she played a big role in his discoveries. I have a certain protectiveness around her, in part, I think, because she was the first of these stories, but also I think she was the one who was most marginalized in some ways, the least mm. able to do the work that she was called to do because of her circumstances. And then I just had such a unique and special time writing my co-written book, The Personal Librarian, which is about Belle de Costa Green, the personal librarian to the famous financier in the early 1900s, J.P. Morgan. Uh, she was one of the most successful people in the art world during her time, but she was only able to fulfill that role by hiding her true identity. She was a Black woman passing as white during an era of American segregation. And I forged exploring her life was such an honor, but to do it with my co-writer, Victoria Christopher Murray, who's become not just a co-writer, but like a sister to me. It's just such a transformative period of my life and just really special. So I would say I love them all, but those two. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Look, yeah. we are starting to run out of time. So we'll talk a little bit now about your reading taste and whether you binge read and what you're currently reading that you'd like to recommend to people. So I do binge read and depend when you ask me what I'm reading, it will vary wildly. So when I'm doing writing or editing, I cannot read in my genre. I just can't. I can't read historical fiction. It's too close. It permeates the, my way of thinking and I can't take that risk. So I just came off finishing some editing. And so during that time period, I actually binge read a whole mystery series. It's it's by Mick Heron. I think it's called Slough House. I don't know if you're familiar yeah, with it. Yes. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's a great series, a yeah. bunch of the, these misfit yeah. MI5 characters and, you know, good mystery puzzles, but the characters are really fun and it's funny as well. And that was a great break while I was actually finishing this editing and trying to keep away from historical fiction, which I do read a lot when I'm, when I'm not writing myself. Fantastic. A palate cleanser. A palate cleanser. Yeah. With great characters in those books. Really well done. Looking back down the tunnel of time, if you were having your time as a writer over again, is there anything you'd change about the way you proceeded? In many ways, I look back and I think I couldn't have gotten here unless I did everything I did before, right? Yeah. yeah. Some things are practice. My 11 years as a lawyer, you know, I didn't love those, but they were really important for me to get to here. So I don't regret any of it. But what I would tell my younger self is believe in yourself. When I started writing The Other Einstein, people really weren't writing biographical historical fiction then. That wasn't really a thing people did. And that's what I wanted to do. I thought there were so many important historical women that I wanted to write about. Okay. And uh, hemmed and hawed around plunging into that at first. And I would look back and say, go for it. You know, I mean, just, just do it. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, you know, we all come to things when we're ready for them. Yes. And the issues I often explore in those books are, are issues that I couldn't have tackled as a younger woman, issues of having lived. But yeah, I would say believe in myself sooner. That would be my advice to myself. What's next for Maria's writer? What have you got on your desk for the next 12 months? Oh my gosh. Well, I have something coming up very soon. On, in June, on June 27th in the U.S., I have my next co-written book coming out with Victoria, my co-writer. The book is called The First Ladies, and it's the story of this really world-changing friendship between two women. Um, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the wife of the First Lady of the United States during World War II, wife of FDR, and a woman that isn't probably as well known, her name was Mary McLeod Bethune. She was born in the late 1800s, the 15th child born in a family, the first born free. She was born to formerly enslaved parents, rose up to become incredibly educated, started a college, and became during her um, lifetime a very well-known advocate for equality. Eleanor and Mary became like best friends starting in the 1920s at a time period when white and black people were not supposed to be friends. And they forged this unbelievable closeness. And as the years went on, really became so tight and also became much more aligned in the work that they were going to do. And these two women worked behind the scenes to really form the foundation for the civil rights movement in America. And really nobody knows. 
And so for my co-writer and I, it was an, a really exciting opportunity to explore the legacy of these women, but also to explore the way in which it's a little autobiographical when you have to come together to talk about really difficult issues around race. How can you come out the other side? How can you come out closer than you ever could have imagined? And so for us, it was it's a, it was a really special experience to write their story through the our story through the stand ins of, of Mary and Eleanor and also explore these incredible women. Sounds amazing. Thank you. It was a wonder, amazing experience to write it. That's wonderful. You have referred to your work as like an archaeology, really, of the literary field. And it sounds like this is a perfect example. Yeah, it, it really is. You know, sometimes I'm unearthing, but sometimes I'm talking about totally unknown women. And sometimes Eleanor Roosevelt in our country is very, very well known. And Mary McLeod, but even less so. But this part of their friendship, this part of these women, their, this friendship, there's almost nothing written about it. And so we really had to excavate, like you said, dig into nooks and crannies to try and find the connections and the crossovers and the implications of their relationship. And that was just a wonderful journey to do. Fantastic. Now, do you enjoy talking with your readers and where can they find you online? I love to. I mean, so much of what I do is sitting right here in my office. It's just me. And I went on my first book tour, really, since COVID with the Midford Affair. I'd gone out and done a couple of things, but not like an actual tour. So that's been exciting to get back out there. People can always reach me on my website, authormariebenedict.com. I'm on Facebook and Instagram, Author Marie Benedict. I don't do Twitter and some of those other things, but, but <laughs> I am pretty responsive and I do love to connect with people. Thanks so much, Marie. It's been wonderful talking. Thank you. It's been such a treat. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Irish author and international bestseller Liz Nugent, the master of psychological thrillers, is on the show next time talking about her latest book, Strange Sally Diamond. Liz is the winner of numerous fiction awards and readers and critics are utterly absorbed by her twisty, compulsive psychological thrillers that also combine surprising humour and pathos. That's next time on Binge Reading. That's it for today. Thanks for listening and happy reading.